And while people are taking their seats, I uh, wanted to thank you, all of you again for coming out for uh, the symposium. It's been wonderful to have everyone here. We do have an evaluation form, which I'm sure some of you have picked up. Uh, the table here, make sure that you fill that out before you leave. And we are going to try to have 15, 20 minutes after this panel for just sort of a general discussion on, on all the panels and thoughts and questions that you wanted to ask, but that we ran out of time to ask. And so, uh, so we'll get to that. But for now, I will turn the panel over to uh, Professor Knudsen. Good afternoon. I'm glad to see that there's still some people here. Uh, uh, with me today, I have uh, Michael Levine, who was uh, previously introduced, and I'm going to reintroduce him again, uh, who I would characterize as an activist advocate. Um, he has a bachelor's in uh, civil and environmental engineering from Cornell, a JD, and his master's in environmental management uh, from Duke. Odd how many people from Duke there are here today. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> has been working with Earth Justice in Juneau and is now with Oceana, one of the larger um, environmental advocacy organizations. I'll make my way over here this time. Thank you, uh, Professor Knudsen. And um, one of the dangers, of course, of talking at this time of day is that everyone's snoozing or eating cookies. But one of the one of the or chips, one of the joys is uh, being able to incorporate by reference the earlier presentations. And so I owe a debt of gratitude to to Fran, who's gone, and to Willie Hensley for their presentations because they've uh, managed to allow me to streamline mine. Um, I also owe debts of gratitude to my co-authors on the paper, Andrew Hartzig from Ocean Conservancy and Maggie Clements. Um, Andrew, in particular, has been my co-conspirator in a lot of the thinking that's led to this and in a number of other things. Um, and as long as I um, have derailed into debts of thanks, I also owe one to Tom Metzloff. He probably doesn't remember this, but back when he was the Dean of Students in 2000, um, and I was searching, had just come back from Alaska um, from the summer and was sort of searching for my way, I had, uh, I think, the one and only meeting with him, maybe the only time I was ever in the Dean's office. Um, and, yeah, and, and during that conversation, he, he relayed to me um, uh, something I thought about actually over the course of the day today, uh, that one of the big changes he'd seen in his life was the end of littering. And that when he was a, a young person, you'd go on a trip down the highway and just pfft, all your trash out the window. And, and over time, um, that changed and it's no longer acceptable. And one of the things we're talking about here is change. Um, change in the Arctic, change in decision-making structure, and it's not going to be easy change, um, but it's possible. And, and I, I take that lesson not just as, a, as an activist and an advocate, but as someone who hopes for better decision-making structures and better decisions going forward. So I, I take that lesson to heart and I share that story. It's stick with me 15 years later. Um, I am going to talk today about a little piece of this puzzle. Um, we've talked a lot about broad themes today and um, the need for improving decision-making structures and governance. One little piece of this is administered by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and uh, that's what I'm going to break off and talk about today. Um, and I'm going to start and make the same apology that Betsy did earlier. If you've ever seen me talk, you've seen this slide. This is my introduction to what Oceana does, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, we are an international nonprofit organization dedicated to maintaining and restoring the world's oceans. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C., have offices in several countries around the world. Um, all of our West Coast work is headquartered in Juneau, where I am. We have nine employees in Juneau, smaller offices in Portland and Monterey. And we view what we do as working through this triangle of law, science, and public policy to affect in the water change that leads to sustainable management of ocean resources. Um, and one of those oceans that we work on is the U.S. Arctic Ocean. I'm not going to belabor this slide. Fran did more, uh, Fran and, and Willie Hensley did more to talk about this, um, the importance of the Arctic, its diversity, the role it plays in the rest of the world um, than, than I can. Similarly, um, we know it's changing. Again, Fran talked about this this morning, the rapid change, uh, rapid warming in the Arctic, the loss of sea ice. I will highlight that um, due to uh, colder temperatures and freshwater input, the Arctic Ocean is l uniquely susceptible to ocean acidification, um, and recent studies have shown that it's starting to happen there. So we're going to see additional cascading impacts in the ecosystem and their corollary effects on the communities along the Arctic coast. Um, Along with, the, uh, along with the receding sea ice and um, world demand comes 
the increase for industrial activities. Again, Fran highlighted shipping, offshore oil and gas, tourism, um, and there is the potential for large-scale commercial fishing. Right now, the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas are closed to commercial fishing until and unless um, they can be managed sustainably, but warning temperatures indicate that, that even that industrial threat may be coming. And, and with coming industrialization or the potential for it um, come risk. And it's not just the risk of catastrophic accident. Uh, industrial activities necessarily bring smaller amounts of water pollution, air pollution, noise pollution, um, and, and simply bringing industrialization to a place that um, has seen relatively little of it, of it over uh, preceding millennia. Um, these industrial activities and, and decisions that are made about how to manage risk are hindered by um, by a number of factors. We're talking about a place, the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, that are really far from anything, right? Nearest, res nearest substantial response capacity is about 1,000 miles away in Kodiak. You got bad weather. It's dark. I mean, those of you who came from, um, from Durham, see, that didn't get light this morning until 8 o'clock, right? You know, it's going to be dark most, a lot of the year up in the Arctic, bad weather, unpredictable conditions, especially now that the climate's changing, we're starting to see um, less predictability. And um, something I'll talk about in a minute and mentioned earlier, a lack of basic understanding of these ocean ecosystems. The last baseline studies of the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas were done in the late 70s. Um, there's been a lot of targeted science that's been done soon, uh, recently, a lot of efforts to incorporate local and traditional knowledge but there's still substantial gaps in the basic understanding of what's in the ocean, where, what time of year, how it might react to industrial um, stresses. And so ultimately you've got a place that's unique, it's changing, and it's threatened. And the way at Oceana we think about this problem is kind of as this hourglass. We know that now we've got functioning ocean ecosystems, we know they're changing, and the choices we're making about industrial activities are going to affect what those ocean ecosystems look like in 20 years, in 50 years, in 100 years. And, um, and we have the opportunity now to craft a vision for what we want the region to look like over time and then make choices based on that vision. And that's the ultimate goal and that's one of the things that, that we're working towards. Um, and to echo some of the comments earlier, there's no single statute that governs these choices. There's no single federal agency charged with making them. Same is true about oceans writ large in the US, but it's uh, true as well about the Arctic. And so we're left with piecemeal approaches to making these decisions. Um, we, you know, we talked earlier about all the different reports and all the different agencies and entities. Um, and I'm going to break off now from this larger conversation about how to make choices about how and whether to authorize these industrial activities to talk about offshore oil and gas. And in a room full of lawyers, I'm going to begin with the statute. The Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act governs um, offshore oil and gas activities in federal waters from three to 200 nautical miles. Um, that's its policy statement to make those uh, resources available subject to environmental safeguards. The statute was originally passed in 1953 when it occurred to somebody that maybe there was oil under the ocean that people would want to get. Um, it was amended substantially in 1978 to its current fashion, uh, current format. It's been amended since, but basically the format has stayed the same. I'm not going to read this um, complicated looking chart, but just basically summarize the four main stages of activities. Um, at the first and most broad stage, the federal government, through its Department of Interior, creates a planning document, a five-year leasing program, in which it sets out a schedule of lease sales in places in the ocean. So it includes or excludes areas and then identifies um, when lease sales might be held. At the second stage, it proceeds to evaluate and hold those sales. And in those lease sales, companies can purchase uh, the rights to leases on which um, they're allowed in the third stage to apply for the right to drill exploration wells. Um, at the third stage, uh, if exploration drilling is approved, Companies can drill wells, and if they find um, developable quantities of oil, move on to the fourth stage um, at which they can apply for the right to produce and develop oil offshore. At various of these stages, other statutes come into play. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act applies at all four stages, and when you get down to the third and fourth stage, actually operating in the water, um, government and companies have to comply with the Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, um, Marine Mammal Protection Act, and a few other statutes. And what we're going to see next um, is 
what has been the effect of management under this statute. So this slide, assuming it works, and yep, it's, so this is, movie is going to show you um, the wells that have been drilled in the Gulf of Mexico. It, it predates uh, Oxlo, but if you start to pay attention to um, the size of the circles, the size of the circles correlate to the depth of the wells. And so these are all the wells leading up to eventually you'll see the Deepwater Horizon, uh, the Macondo well um, over there on the right. And the reason I show this is because w it, at least as well as I can um, figure, shows you what's happening in the industry in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, the industry is being pushed further and further from shore and deeper and deeper. The nature of um, the risks and the technologies are changing. Um, and it is uh, pretty much undeniable that this is going to continue. The, the percentage of oil coming from deep water and ultra deep water, 5,000 or more feet underwater, is growing and is predicted to grow. Um, and the technological advances that are being made in the industry are going, are going to continue. With the, um, with the movement further offshore and deeper come different risks, pressures, um, et cetera, that were exemplified in the deep water horizon tragedy in 2010. There, um, there has been some offshore exploration and production off the coast of California, but the other area of primary interest now is in the Arctic. So under this statutory framework, um, leases were sold and exploration wells drilled in the 80s and 90s. By the time we got to 2000, they were for the most part all gone, um, and we were left with a clean slate. The um, George W. Bush administration came into office in 2001 and began preparation of the 2002 to 2007 five-year leasing program. That's that first stage, broad level. Um, under that leasing program, uh, three sales were held in the Beaufort Sea, 186, 195, and 202. About 1.4 million acres were sold um, in those three sales. So that's the second stage, leasing. Um, under the next five-year leasing program, 2007 to 12, lease sale 193 was held in the Chukchi Sea. About 2.1 million acres were sold. So over the course of five years, between 2003 and 2008, we went from no leases being owned offshore in the Arctic to somewhat north of, of three, acre, three million acres being owned by companies. Shell began the process of seeking approvals to drill exploration wells in 2007. Um, it has yet to complete any of those wells. Um, but it has indicated a uh, desire to go back in 2015 and beyond to continue this exploration process. Um, one of the results of the efforts to drill um, these exploration wells in 2012 show completed two top holes um, and ran into a myriad of problems that I'm not going to go into too much detail about here. I think most people are familiar with it. Suffice it to say that the, the season ended with the drill um, rig Kulik uh, crashed on an island near Kodiak. Eventually the rig had to be scrapped. Um, the company ran afoul of the Clean Air Act, paid more than a million dollars in penalties. It had a fire and an explosion on its other drill ship. The Discoverer has ended up having to replace all four engines in that ship. It um, has been subject to Coast Guard investigation, EPA investigation, et cetera. It wasn't a success overall. Um, and many of the problems the company ran into uh, exemplify the risks that I mentioned earlier of remoteness, difficult conditions, um, uh, risk management, et cetera. Um, and so uh, to highlight, um, as we've talked about the Arctic, unique threat and changing, we've got an industry that's being forced to more remote places and difficult places. The nature of this industry is changing. The nature of the risks it's facing are changing both in the Gulf of Mexico and in the Arctic. And, um, and that's led to um, some calls for reform. Uh, Fran held up the Deepwater Horizon Commission report. Um, that report highlighted, uh, oh, there it is again, lots of, uh, lots of areas in which um, this process could be improved. Um, many of them focused on preven spill prevention, response, preparedness, but there was also a call for fundamental reform of this process, of changing the culture for how these decisions are made, thinking holistically about um, planning and leasing. And we've seen similar, similar calls in light of the problems in the Arctic. The first of these quotes is from Mayor Itta from the North Slope Borough, um, referring to just how fast this moved. All those leases being sold, the company wanting to move out there, it led to substantial controversy and litigation. Um, there have been challenges to five-year leasing programs, lease sales, exploration, um, a substantial amount of litigation on behalf of local governments, um, tribes, and of course, conservation organizations. 
Um, that litigation has been surprisingly successful from the plaintiff's side, um, which exemplifies, at least from my perspective, just how poorly justified the decisions were, because those cases are very hard to win. Um, second has been the lack of science I mentioned earlier. That quotes from 2005 from the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. Um, substantial advances have been made since then, both by industry and government, um, but still there's lots of uh, unknowns. Um, the third one, that's from a New York Times article from 2010 uh, talking about the um, Alaska region of MMS. And um, so some of the cultural problems that were called, uh, called to light after the Deepwater Horizon accident um, in Denver and other places also happened up here. Um, and finally, uh, we've seen some of the problems with response. That last quote is from um, the uh, tests that Shell prepared on their um, containment dome in Puget Sound it didn't work out all that well for the company. So um, we need change. And one of the things that the commissioners in the Deepwater Horizon Commission talked about was congressional action. We saw congressional action after the Santa Barbara spill in 1969, and I will be the second presenter today to laud Richard Nixon because he was responsible for signing some of the statutes there, right? Um, and after the Exxon Valdez spill, uh, we had the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. After the Deepwater Horizon, we've largely had nothing. Um, the Restore Act was passed. That deals with funding for restoration. Um, there's been no substantive action on the part of Congress to address any of uh, the other problems that were made evident. Um, and in fact, most of the legislation being considered now is designed to expand um, offshore activities and reduce the uh, bureaucracy that goes into them. So Congress hasn't done anything. What about? Um, what about the executive branch? We have seen some substantial progress on, uh, on the agency's behalf. Most notably, the um, Department of the Interior broke apart the Minerals Management Service into the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, Office of Natural Resources Revenue. We've seen an increased focus on science. Um, Betsy talked about integrated Arctic management. Um, we've seen some advances in the Arctic in particular, uh, with moving away from broad area-wide leasing, trying to think about a more targeted leasing approach so that um, local impacts could be taken into consideration. We've also seen um, improvement in safety culture. Uh, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement has passed uh, or promulgated a new um, prevention and response a drilling rule, I think they called it. And they're moving, we're moving forward with Arctic-specific standards as well. Um, which finally brings me to the topic of the presentation. What's missing, right? What is none of this addressed? Not Congress, not any of these administrative changes. They haven't looked at all at any of the first parts of that OXLA process. How are we deciding where we're going to authorize these kind of activities and under what conditions? And those decisions are made by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. It's the section of the Department of the Interior charged with creating five-year leasing programs, making decisions about lease sales, and, um, and approving exploration. So as we thought about trying to improve the decision-making structure, we thought about, well, what flexibility or room does, does BOEM have to improve the way it does it independent of congressional action? went back and looked at their regulations. And this is actually a, a quote from, um, from the draft of our article because it was difficult to figure out how to prove a negative. Um, but the regulations governing uh, five-year planning and lease sales were, were promulgated after OXLA was amended in 1979 and haven't changed since. Um, they're exactly the same. They've uh, been amended to move, they've moved around the Code of Federal Regulations, but they're basically the same. They haven't been updated to account for changes in industry, for accidents, for things we've learned in the last 35 years. Um, so that was, that was uh, surprising to note that they were that old. Um, but old doesn't necessarily mean bad. Um, in this case, however, they are old and bad. Um, the left-hand quote is from Oxla. That's the standard that uh, BOEM uses to figure out how it's going to um, design its five-year leasing program. It makes that determination based on a consideration of nine factors, um, sensitivity of, of ocean environment, um, risk, economic gain, um, a whole bunch of them. 
the regs that implement that statutory guidance are shorter in total than the statutory provision, which is not something I think I've ever seen. Um, this is them. I, I don't know how well you can see it. Those are the titles of all the regs that are even potentially relevant to the five-year leasing program. You'll notice that none of them deal with balancing risks and benefits. None of them deal with um, sizes of leasing. All of them deal with getting input from states, um, and there's almost nothing of any true in the water substance. Um, oh, then, sorry, I skipped. The same is true of the leasing regs. They're a little longer, but they deal primarily with bidding processes um, and post lease operations. None of them deal in any way with how big a lease sale should be, what considerations you uh, think about when you're trying to decide whether to hold it, et cetera. The um, BOEM regs about exploration plan approvals are similar. This is not something we really talked about too much in our paper, um, but these regs are framed like a conversation with an oil company. Um, this is just an example I pulled uh, from there. They also don't provide real guidance to the regulators about how to make decisions. They're, um, they're process-oriented for a company about how to get an approval. So regs are old. They're not all that great. Um, what changes could be made and what could we do going forward. The agency is promulgating these Arctic-specific prevention and response regs. Those are a good step. They're necessary. Um, they live at, the, uh, at OMB right now, and the recent news was that um, Shell and ConocoPhillips have visited OMB to argue about why these rules are too expensive and shouldn't be promulgated. Um, we'll see how that turns out. Um, so, but these, these rules still only address part of the issue. They only address choices. They only address operations in the ocean after choices have been made to move forward. And in our view, that's just the beginning. Um, we ought to start thinking more broadly. And let's, let's think about how we can incorporate some of the things we've talked about here today into better planning and better leasing, holistic decision making. Um, and, and in so doing, we can um, take into account what we've learned about the risks and the changing nature of the industry. We can also take into account um, changes in policy over the last 35 years. Uh, we heard earlier about the uh, National Arctic Strategy. Um, that's something that could be appropriately considered. National Ocean Plan, um, the, the president's commitment to open government, the existing regulations do not do a very good job of ensuring public involvement and access to information. Um, and the last, uh, advantage to doing something like this um, is that it would provide some measure of certainty to, to companies. Um, this quote is from Jack Gerard, president of API, after ConocoPhillips decided to forego drilling, its uh, exploration drilling in 2013. There's something to be said for good standards that are understandable um, and uh, involve the public. Um, and I think that's it. And I gather we're going to wait for questions until after, despite my slide. Thank you. So while Mike is uh, uh, clearing up, I'd like to introduce um, the next uh, activist on our panel here. This is uh, Harry Afoski, who introduced herself to me as an academic activist, but I like to think of her instead of as an activist academic. Uh, she has her PhD in geography from the University of Oregon, her JD from Yale. She's a professor of law and director of the joint degree program in law, science, and technology at the University of Minnesota uh, Law School. She's very widely published, um, the co-author of a book uh, that came out two years ago on climate change law in policy, and has uh, numerous uh, journal publications uh, that uh, address climate change from the suburban level all the way to the international law level. And you can read her very detailed biography in the materials. Um, well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I also want to, of course, join the, uh, everyone else in thanking Ryan Fortson from the UAA Justice Center. Um, the folks from um, the Alaska Law Review, particularly the um, editor-in-chief, um, Philip, Philip Tarpley, and its advisor, um, Tom Metzloff, um, the Arctic Law section of the Alaska Bar Association, which is also co-sponsoring this. Um, uh, so Mara, I guess, gets a thanks in that capacity as well, right? 
Um, and then also, um, particularly wanted to thank Betsy Baker. Um, I would not be here otherwise. As people may know, I was a bit of a last minute addition to all of this. So um, and she invited me to something yesterday. Um, I also just want to acknowledge my co-author on these projects, Jessica Shadian, who's, who's not here with us. Um, so in some ways, um, I am going to now take us back out, right? So we focused in, in particular, on the leasing pro process, and I want to sort of talk about the big picture. I don't need to say to this room in the same way as I might in the lower 48 um, that this, this sort of, th there's a real need to focus on the adequacy of offshore drilling regulation. Um, uh, this is a critical emerging frontier along the emerging frontiers theme of this conference um, with, with major economic and environmental implications. Um, and I also wanted to just flag that I'm presenting kind of not just in my capacity as an academic, um, but also as, as director of our energy transition lab, um, uh, the faculty director of it, which is focusing on working with governments and business and, 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 and um, communities to really try to make progress in energy transition. Um, so my interest in this topic comes both from the fact that I worked extensively um, in the aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill and governance and justice issues, publishing <laughs> academic articles, but also um, my students and I made a several hundred page submission to the National Commission on environmental justice issues. Um, and, um, and so um, the kinds of offshore drilling issues here um, have a lot of obviously synergies with some of the questions that got raised in the aftermath of that spill. Um, and, and so what I want to do, if I can figure out, how do you, there we go. Um, what I want to do today, and, and I'll try to do all of this relatively briefly, um, uh, and it looks like my slides are not quite sized the way they were on my computer, so if that's physical in case it wasn't clear. It used to be all one word. Um, anyway, uh, what I want to do is focus in very briefly, because we've already covered it, that's the joy of being one of the last speakers, uh, as, as, um, as, as, as uh, uh, um, has already been said, um, uh, focus in briefly on kind of the, the drilling drivers and challenges and just try to highlight a few things that I think haven't been fully highlighted today. Um, then talk in a little bit more depth than we got into in that interchange with Fran about the multi-level regulatory approaches to Arctic offshore drilling um, and some of the core governance challenges that I think result from that. And then I want to talk about more effective governance, drilling down in particular on just the explosion of different kinds of um, efforts and proposals that have been going on. So, um, why, why is it that, you know, in this time when we're talking about energy transition, there's this real focus on that? Um, I, I think just one of the things I want to really highlight is that there's still massive demand for oil and gas. Um, and that massive demand for oil and gas means that offshore drilling is going to happen. So, I mean, it's begun to happen, but it's going to happen. And, and not only is it, is it going to happen more, right? And, and, and I think there are physical and market reasons why it might not happen as quickly as some people say it will. Um, but, um, but it also, um, you know, that, I mean, it's in, in, in why, why I think that, that sort of, it's important of a conversation assuming it's going to happen, um, even if people don't like it, right? Um, because, um, I mean, I think there are a lot of environmental groups who just think it shouldn't happen. But given how successful the Obama administration's effort was to ban offshore drilling in the Gulf um, in the immediate aftermath of a massive oil spill, I just, you know, I think the political realities are what they are and the economic realities are what they are around this. So we've already heard today um, about the combination of the major decline in sea ice in the summer with the fact that there's 30 percent of the global undiscovered natural gas and 13 percent of the um, uh, undiscovered oil um, are in the Arctic. Um, but uh, I wanted to highlight two other things. Um, one is that 80% of that undiscovered oil and gas that people are talking about is offshore. So the reason that this offshore conversation is so critical is that when you look at the remaining resources, they're not mostly on land here, they're mostly in the sea. Um, and, um, and that's happening at the same time as there's very rapidly changing technology. And I want to drill down on that rapidly changing technology. Because 
that rapidly changing technology doesn't simply make oil and gas accessible in places it didn't used to be. Um, and I've done a fair amount of work in, on, on hydraulic fracturing issues as well in the lower 48. Um, but it also creates market challenges. So those of you who've been watching this closely know that one of the things that's stalling out projects up here is that natural gas has gotten really cheap because of fracking. But oil, and it, because of Saudi Arabia's behavior lately, oil has gotten actually very cheap too. And so as a consequence of that, um, it's, it's really expensive in Arctic conditions, right, to, to do stuff. And so, um, and so some of these projects have just been made unsustainable economically in the short term. That's not the long term. That's the short term. Um, but um, the other thing that, that all of this technological change did is it allowed um, the kind of deep water drilling that you saw in the Gulf of Mexico prior to the spill and, and still, right? And, um, and it's important to remember that ultra deep water drilling, like you're seeing in the Gulf of Mexico right now, is only a product of the last decade. Um, there's been this rapid development of technology that's allowed for that ultra deep water drilling. Um, and, 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 and sort of use of technology has also been part of why you're seeing this expansion of hydraulic fracturing. But the physical conditions of the Arctic are so much harder than that of the Gulf. I don't need to tell anyone in the room this, and I'm not going to belabor this point. Um, but I do think when, you know, people are talking about climate change and, and, and how much more accessible the Arctic is, that it's important just to, to take one moment to say, yeah, but it's only like three months a year that it's super accessible. And even in those three months a year, there's still a wind, waves, and visibility issues um, that make operations incredibly perilous and the risks of spills higher um, if it's not done um, very carefully. So, there are also major issues. I mean, one of the things you hear uniformly is that, you know, the, the, the big scary disaster people are worried about is, is, a, is a BP kind of spill in, in the Arctic, right? Because the, we just don't have the capacity to clean it up. Nobody's been demonstrated the ability to deal with a spill of that magnitude with ice. Um, how, how you get that stuff out of the water. Um, and not to mention, I mean, we were having a conversation, um, uh, I was having a conversation yesterday during, during one of my meetings. Um, uh, about the fact that, you know, there, there's also the issue of, I mean, there were these unprecedented use of dispersants that happened in the aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Nobody really knows what they did in the Gulf, in the Arctic, right? I mean, there's just a whole set of really difficult questions about what would happen in that that uh, ideally one never gets to, right? Um, I mean, one gets to, but one never has to actually get to in real time. So. As Betsy and Mara both highlighted in the context of other problems, there are deeply fragmented regulatory approaches at multiple levels by many entities that are relevant when you're talking about offshore drilling. And I know some of you are deeply expert in this and some of you it's newer, so I'm, I apologize to those who are already deeply expert. Um, first of all, let's put on an international law hat. There is substantial international law applicable here. And one of the things I want to start with, because we've talked about unclose, but there's something that goes before unclose. And that is state sovereignty over natural resources. State sovereignty over natural resources is why nation states have property rights in the first place, both over their land, I mean, that's part of how they, they I mean, how, you know, in the, in the sort of colonial and the taking from native peoples, I mean, it was all about state sovereignty over natural resources. Um, and that's sort of the core under which UNCLOS operates. So we've been hearing about the UN Convention um, on the Law of the Sea and United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And, and, and as, as you know, um, the US is not a party, as, as Fran Elmer mentioned. But I do want to highlight that part of why we get to function under it with the exclusive economic zones rather than even though we can't do the continental shelf negotiations is because we accept it as customary international law. So for those of you who don't sort of hang out in international law, right, there are two primary sources, treaties, custom, and so, um, and so we are essentially asserting a bunch of rights. And mainly, the reason we accept it as customary international law is because we want the 200 exclusive, you know, miles of exclusive economic zone. There's, there's big money involved in asserting those rights. Um, so it's not that we're fully non-participatory. And we also participated in the 2008 declaration um, in which all the Arctic nations said, UNCLOS is going to govern how we do property rights here. So it's that combination of state sovereignty over natural resources that create a lot of the core of the international law property rights here. But there are a ton of other conventions that apply. I don't have time to go in any depth into them. But there are conventions on marine pollution, MARPOL, the London Convention, et cetera, um, that also apply in this context. Treaties, of course, don't fully resolve it. 
And a lot of the really interesting action at an international level, at a regional level, is happening under the <laughs> Arctic Council. I don't want to belabor the Arctic Council because, again, we've heard about it today. Um, but um, I do want to highlight that in addition to the eight um, Arctic states that are participating, there are six indigenous organizations that function as permanent participants, four of which are Alaskan. Um, or, I mean, not fully Alaskan, some of them, they're also Canadian, but, but, but four of them represent Alaskans. Um, and there are also 32 other nation states, IGOs and NGOs, that are participating, including a number of recent non-Arctic states joining into that status. Now, it has no treaty powers, as Frame Al Almer noted, but it shapes policy fact-finding and brings together key stakeholders, such as around the search and rescue and Arctic marine oil pollution. Now, Part of why we can't just focus international in this conversation, though, is because that would really miss the complex multi-level dynamics going on here. So I include an, an, an image from the Brookings um, report on offshore drilling. Um, and, uh, and, and as Betsy suggested, I think it's important to problematize this image um, in two specific ways. First, you might note, if you can read it, that they've left off indigenous peoples um, in this little triangle, which is sort of a problem. Um, and the other, the other sort of problem is just the idea of it as a triangle, um, both in terms of differential sizes, but also all of these things are interacting in a complex web that a, that a triangle doesn't capture. Um, but what it does do, I think, um, to some extent, is it shows kind of that there's a plethora of, of, of federal, of national laws and regulations and standards functioning. Um, and we should then add in also the other thing that's missing, of course, from this, but this one is Alaska, right? So there's also a bunch of state law that's relevant here. And there's also a bunch of, of, of as I'll talk about more on a slide later where I actually show some of it, um, actions by indigenous peoples. Um, here are the international conventions I already talked about and some of the regional agreements and the bilateral agreements. So this is all essentially international law at various scales. Um, but, but what I want to highlight for you, and I'll highlight in more depth on another slide, is that there are also a number of industry organizations, standard organizations, et cetera, that, that don't have international law status. They're not nation states, but they create standards that are really relevant to some of these safety questions um, and that often aren't fully integrated into how we talk about the regulation here. Now, this is only the tip of the iceberg of the problem, though, because there's also deep fragmentation at the international and domestic interface here. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my question to Fran Ulmer, for some reason, the United States government has decided that it would be wise that for the six different working groups of the Arctic Council, we'd have a different federal agency on each one. I mean, OK. Um, and the State Department supposedly serves in this overall coordinating role. But there are varying reports on how well it's doing that overall coordination. But that's not all, folks. Here's domestic law on, um, oil, on, on, on um, drilling regulation um, and oil and gas. And this is a very simplified version of the mess. Again, as you can see, the scaling of my slide got a little bit uh, messed up. So you can keep your mind awake by puzzling out the complete words that were supposed to be there. Um, but these Arctic-specific structures I've been talking about are against a backdrop of very complex U.S. law on offshore drilling and spills that's been evolving, sometimes with specific reference to Arctic, um, uh, like the, the new standards that we've been hearing a lot about today, um, in the aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster. So just to flag a few of these things, right? So you have um, over here, we've been hearing a lot about OSCO already today, so I don't need to go into any depth, right? Um, but so you have kind of this this backdrop of, of state and federal law, depending on how far offshore you are, that, that applies um, to, to, these, to these regulations. But that's not all, because one thing that we haven't talked about today that I think is very worth highlighting is that almost all of these big um, kind of drilling operations are not just done by one company. So there tends to be a bunch of subcontracting relationships. In the aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, for example, there was a staggering number of subcontracting relationships. And for those of you who don't know, those are governed actually, they're governed by federal law, but by state contract law as federal law. So in the BP situation, they were governed by Louisiana contract law. Here they would be governed by Alaskan contract law. And then there's of course property law. And property law becomes very relevant here when you're talking about who owns the set of rights, when you're talking about native questions, et cetera. Okay. 
That's just on the, the sort of drilling side. Then there's the spill side. So in theory, you might say, but wait a second. The spill stuff, it's really simple. We have this national contingency plan. And the national contingency plan is designed to bring together the 15 key federal agencies and make them all work together since we're not going to rewrite the law and put it all under one agency because that would be too simple. Right? Well, the problem is that while in theory that's the case, if you look at the on the ground reality of what happened in the aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, that's not really how it functions. So one of the first problems is that a bunch of states um, asserted sort of na disaster under the Sherman Act. Well, why did they do that? Because the National Contingency Plan clearly applied. The reason they did that was purely political. Under the National Contingency Plan, the federal government controls. Under the Sherman Act, the state government controls. They just get the money flowing to them. So even though this didn't fall under the Sherman Act, states still asserted it, and it still caused a lot of conflict and confusion. Similarly, even though the National Contingency Plan governed where the, the boom went, right? so the boom trying to block the land, um, you know, you can imagine if you are in a local community, you, so, so the national government is trying to put the boom based on where the currents are, but if you're a local community, you want it in your community. So local communities weren't giving up the boom when the Coast Guard wanted to shift it, and there were all sorts of bizarre conflicts over boom, made worse by the fact that, uh, that, that communities began to use money given directly by BP under various compensation schemes to sort of control, try to control some of that. So you end up with all sorts of weird conflicts around that. And even among the federal agencies, and forget that DOE for some reason isn't included in, in the National Contingency Plan group, there were subgroups of agencies that were making decisions outside of the National Contingency Plan structure on all sorts of important things like dispersants and fisheries. Um, and then states have their own mini oil pollution acts, um, and of course tort law also ends up coming into play here. And so again, you know, what you see is yet another layer of the legal mess that, that um, governs all this. Wow, it's like missing most of my formatting. Um, it's too bad. Okay. I, uh, okay, so this has all, this is supposed to have all these cool gears that are interlocking all of it. It's kind of a neat looking slide. But in any case, you can, you can be imaginative as to what the slide looks like. These are like gears with spokes <coughs> um, and arrows pointing all over the place. Um, so, you, so what am I, why am I, why are they supposed to be gears with spokes? Because um, what I think we need to think about in this context is sort of some of the lessons from the BP spill. Um, and I want to highlight particular lessons um, from the BP spill to, to, to think about in the Arctic context. So the first thing is that, that if you've read the National Commission report, um, and I agree with their conclusion on this, this was not because it was a high-risk venture. This was an entirely preventable spill. This was about safety culture and about systemic decisions um, to ignore clear risks, right? At every stage of the process, right? So when they couldn't drill deep enough, because they, they hit sort of um, shaky ground, essentially. Um, they just remodeled it and decided that they drilled deep enough. Um, when the cement, they were using a new kind of cement that was dubious to begin with. And when the cement failed the test, they had Halliburton rerun the test. Um, you know, um, similarly with casing, their original casing choice, which they decided they needed to be safe, they couldn't get it. So they said, oh, we'll rerun the model. This is safe enough. Um, and even with the day of the spill itself, and we won't know exactly what happened because the people who were doing the monitoring died, but there were clear moments at which there, was, there were sort of things that you could see of something coming up um, that were, were ignored. And, and just before that, there was also a test, a pressure test, that, was in, that, that essentially said there was a problem that was ignored. Right? So there were plenty of signs before the blowout happens and messes up the blowout preventer that everybody got focused on that, that this whole thing was, was preventable. Um, so, when you start to look at sort of Arctic, um, so, so, so one of the things when you look at Arctic specific issues, right, is, is so how do you change this? And as, as we've already heard about, and I don't need to reiterate again because I don't want to take up too much time, but as Mike already talked about, you know, one of the hopeful things that's coming out of here is not just, uh, out of all of this mess, is not just Arctic specific safety standards, but also, um, uh, sort of ostensible changes in safety culture. It's of course hard to tell, right, until the next accident essentially, uh, in some ways, how much those safety culture changes have actually happened. Um, but there are at least things on the books 
right? You don't know what the individual operators are doing in their choices always, but on the books, it's, it's, it's at least looking a little bit better than the, deep, than the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So, but the combination of that governance <coughs> mess and the story of what happened in the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill highlights four core governance challenges that are going to need to be taken into account to make sure that there's safety in the Arctic context. So one is um, that with the diversity of stakeholders, it's really important, and we've heard a lot today also about the importance of making sure that the key stakeholders are actually at the table, not just consulted with, um, in, an, in, in a sort of you know, consultation process that takes a lot of time but may not have much impact. But so meaningful consultation, but also people at the table. And we've seen successful examples, and they've been talked about today, I'm not gonna belabor them, of, of, that, that, kind of, um, of that kind of consultation. But what, what, but what makes this context, I think, particularly tricky is the sheer number of stakeholders. The sheer complexity of the governance entities involved makes this balancing between, and, and the roles that, that different entities have, makes this balancing between inclusion and efficiency, I think, particularly tricky in this context. Secondly, and I'm not gonna belabor it because we've been beating this horse all day, right? This is deeply fragmented. And deeply fragmented in a way that means that there's not sort of a clear, coherent path of how, if you wanna make regulation better, you do it. Um, there, there are the physical constraints of this environment <coughs> that are, interacting with the governance problem. So I've been talking about um, how difficult it is in the physical environment to drill, but it's not just that it's a difficult physical drilling environment. It's also that you have isolated communities and drilling sites um, and the need to regulate differently in different seasons. And so those physical constraints aren't simply difficulties in spill cleanup, but they're governance problems as well in terms of thinking about how to do this. And finally, this danger of private capture of public interest. So, there are a lot of private actors involved in this who have different financial stakes um, and who also differ in how much power and how much money they have. And that creates all sorts of complicated issues in creating kind of these hybrid inclusive structures in making sure that voices really get heard and that some voices don't dominate and that private interests don't dominate the public interest here. So, well, what are we gonna do about it? Well, there are a lot of people and entities who have ideas about what to do about it. And I purposely made this an intensely busy slide, and I actually made it even more busy this morning. Um, um, and in fact, at, at the suggestion of our moderator, um, I, um, she thinks if there was some way I could animate this so you saw all these things jumping on and off, so it really highlighted how ridiculously busy this is. Um, but part of why I'm having you look at all of this simultaneously is because I want to highlight to you how much activity there is going on in this space trying to think about how to make it better and how that itself creates its own complexity of how to move forward, right? So on the government front, you know, we've heard about the national strategy. Um, Betsy mentioned some of the various things that different agencies are doing already. Um, so there are these efforts to create an overarching strategy, regulatory standards, with, with some coordination, as Free and Elmer described, but a lot of it's just fragmented. It's not happening necessarily in an integrated and coordinated way. Um, and in fact, you see one agency reporting to another, right? So GAO reported to congressional requesters on how the U.S. should be participating in the Arctic Council. I mean, there's all sorts of <coughs> interagency conversations going on. Um, the interagency work, working group on the coordination of domestic energy development and permitting in Alaska is trying in some ways to bridge that state federal gap and bring all these entities together. But again, you know, there are questions about how successful that bringing together really is. Um, when you look at indigenous peoples and how they're involved, you have the representation of the Arctic Council that I already talked about, but you also have a number of these organizations taking their own steps. So doing, sort of creating their own policies, creating their own resolutions that aren't necessarily, again, fully integrated into anything else that I'm talking about. Um, you, we've been hearing a lot about the native corporations, the co-management arrangements, um, such as the ones that are, I mean, most relevant to this context, I think, are the ones that arose in the aftermath of the Exxon Valdez spill, um, which, you know, people have critiqued, but, but, but um, and, and um, I don't have time to go into depth in them, because I've actually written about sort of comparing the two in depth elsewhere, but, um, but, you know, they, they certainly seem to have made some progress at integrating key stakeholders <laughs> and being able to have a kind of conversation in this complex context. Then, as I mentioned before, you have all of these industry entities 
that are setting up standards. Um, and those standards, now these entities, you know, so the trade organizations, corporations are sort of voluntary members of them. And then um, they follow them, not because any government's telling them to necessarily, but because they become the standards of these organizations that they're members of. But then sometimes in dialogue with government, these get internalized into governments as well. And then you have all these collaborations that are happening between these various corporate entities with indigenous peoples, with government, et cetera. Um, and finally, last but not least, you have all the reports. And these reports vary in how much depth they go into. They vary in how much they pay attention to any of the other reports and developments. Um, the Brookings one is a particularly good one in terms of highlighting, I think, all of the different multi-level governance structures. Um, so, you know, there are a number of different entities, and this is just, uh, this is not obviously a complete list. There was only so much I could fit in this slide, even going down into 16 point. Um, but at least it should give you a flavor of the different kinds of things going on as people are thinking about moving forward. So there are both things in action, sort of actual strategies and policies, and then there are all sorts of proposals. And so part of the question is, well, what do we do with all of this, right? How do we evaluate this? How do we kind of think about a way to move forward? Um, and there are three things I want to highlight here, because I just don't have time. I've already gone too long to go into any meaningful depth about what it means to move forward from this mess, or this morass. Um, and, and I should say, by mess, I don't necessarily mean that it's all really bad. I think there have been some really good developments. I think, potentially, these new standards coming out of Interior are promising, right? But there's still a governance mess. And the question is, kind of, how do we sort of help a more systematic effort to go forward? Um, I think one of the answers is about integration, right? So, it's about trying to do more systematic analyses of, of both all these different developments and of the reports on all these different developments to try to find places for more coordination, more linkage um, in regulatory efforts and in recommendations, um, and to find ways of having key stakeholders more systematically at the table than they are right now. Um, the second thing is that when new regs are emerging, so what are the key lessons to come out of the VPD Water Horizon oil spill? And one of the ongoing conversations that I was actually talking about in a, in a side conversation with Fred Elmer this morning is this problem. We make regulations slowly. The technology and, and the physical conditions <laughs> change quickly. By the time the regulations come out, prescriptive regulations tend to be somewhat dated. They tend to no longer be keeping up with all of the technology in the industry because it's moving really fast. And it's a little less the case for the shallower water drilling than it is for the deeper water drilling. And I know a lot of the drilling here is shallow water drilling, but there's still a lot of technological change going on. And so one of the questions is, is are the regulations being structured in a way that's dynamic enough that's keeping up the technological change? Um, and one of the big questions is to what extent should, could the United States move towards more of a safety case approach rather than a prescriptive approach? There are downsides to a safety case approach. So a safety case approach is essentially where you prove you're safe instead of having to adhere to very specific technical standards. If you don't have the right regulatory oversight, that doesn't work either. Um, but there's been a lot of conversation about how you make the regulations more dynamic um, in the face of change. And finally, and third, implementation is key in all of this. So China, where I spent a year, has a lot of great environmental laws on the books. Um, whether they get implemented, fully is, is a little less clear if you've been in an air polluted city in China. Um, and so, and, and right, and that's part of the story also of some of the safety culture that we heard in the aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon spill. And so I think one of the key things is that, that our system isn't necessarily broken, but we need to have sort of effective implementation and making sure that people are actually doing what they say they're going to do, that these new safety culture things are really happening, that the new regulatory processes are functioning well. And part of what makes it hard to oversee is this complexity that I was just mapping for you. And so to the extent that we can find ways to create more systematic approaches to cut through that complexity, we can get at, I think, some of these key implementation questions. And with that, um, you know, thank you again um, for, for having me, as, and I look forward to sort of talking with you all collaboratively about opportunities to move forward with this dialogue. I don't think the picture is grim here. I think there's actually a lot of really good regulatory work and energy going on, particularly with the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council coming up. But I think the problem is 
that there's not a, there's sometimes not enough people talking to each other and not enough sort of coordinated efforts going on and and so to the extent that that we can work to forward that I think it's an important in, in moving things forward thank you very much looking at the time I'm going to be very brief in introducing our commentators first we have Matt Finley who is uh, with Ashburn and Mason and whose practice includes a uh, very complex litigation involving oil and gas such as Point Thompson and um, uh, uh, representation of the state of Alaska and large uh, entities in that field. So on the other side I have Judge Tan, Judge Sin Tan, who uh, recently retired as presiding judge of the Superior Court and is a happy man for it. <laughs> and long ago, in the far distant past, he was in the oil and gas section of the Attorney General's office. Thank you. Mr. Finley, would you care to go first? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you um, to, for both presentations. They're very illuminating and laid out problems that I think are certainly facing all of us as it is true is um, greater offshore drilling will occur in the Arctic and will, will occur in a way that we're not familiar with. I mean, it's not new um, to have offshore oil and gas development in Alaska, as many people know. Cook Inlet's been going on for well over 50 years. And even on the North Slope, not all the drilling's happening onshore. There's offshore islands, there's other activity, there's boats going back and forth. So this isn't, isn't entirely uncharted territory. Um, but when you go further offshore, and particularly when you're in you see as isolated as that is, you have to think about how do you balance um, the fact that industry is going to go forward out there and uh, develop the appropriate safeguards. I think one of the assumptions I think came through um, in both of these presentations, and it's one you have to think carefully about, is that, well, and it's one that lawyers that often will think, well, if we, if we just do more regulations, uh, more regulations will that have been, haven't been applied, this will add clarity and that this will solve some of our past problems and that, that this will allow us to move forward rather than simply adding additional layers of complexity and uncertainty onto a situation where everyone agrees we would like less of that. Um, <clears throat> and so I think it's one of the things you have to be very careful about, the notion that, well, we'll put forward some regulations and, well, what's that going to do? And I think you know, Professor Rosowski notes very clearly a couple things. Um, what the past teaches you is sometimes the problem isn't the regulations um, in existence, it's the regulators enforcing them. How do the regulators enforce them? Who's in the chair? How do they interact with industry? Um, it could very well be a lot of the existing regulations are very powerful tools or just not being used properly or correctly. And you know, the instance of Shell's 2012 experience and of the Deepwater Horizon experience, in both of those circumstances, you had BP's conduct and Shell's conduct with out of, was out of compliance with hundreds of regulations and environmental laws already. It's not, you know, here you had a conduct problem on behalf of both of the companies, and it's not clear there's any amount of regulations that you could have enacted that would have prevented something as negligent or worse as Deepwater Horizon or something as I would say is Keystone Cops incompetent is what happened with a lot of what Shell was doing. After all, one of the reasons it wasn't able to complete its wells is because it was out of compliance with existing regulations. And so you have to look at pulling back from that. I do think one of the important lessons here in trying to figure out how you're going to work um, with balancing is the need for more information, certainly, is one of the very important takeaways. Um, when you, given how little is known um, about the Arctic Ocean environment, um, compared to say something like Cook Inlet, um, where you can develop a drilling plan where you understand beluga migration, where you understand water conditions, where you understand fisheries conditions. There's a lot of data to be able to say there's better times a year to be drilling, there's better times a year to be moving your equipment out, and the state DNR works with developers all the time in setting up those rules and working with those mitigation measures. You don't necessarily understand all of that in the Chukchi Sea because, as was pointed out, there's a lot of data that's missing. And so that's one of the focuses should be learning more about that so you can, to the extent you're going to issue more regulations, issue the right ones, understand the specific environment. Um, what's been done before maybe in Quick Inlet or elsewhere might not be what's appropriate for there. And on the flip side of it is you don't necessarily, because so little drilling has been done like Shell has been doing, you don't actually know until you start doing it 
what the appropriate safeguards and measures need to be. I mean, industry doesn't know what happens when you're out there for a full year or two. You can speculate, you can guess, um, but until you've actually been out there and tried to do it, you don't know what happens. And so what's important is to foster a culture between the regulators and industry that's going out there of sharing information so you know and understand, here's our experience, here's what worked, here's didn't, and try to make it a partnership to make sure that you're working with um, is the best safeguards that you can. Thank you. Judge Tan. Well, it's the end of the day, so I'm going to keep my comments very, very short. After all, I'm following all these illustrious speakers, so I really have very little to add. Um, this I know, okay? Accidents will happen, and we start drilling out there, things are going to go wrong. Who would have guessed that, you know, Captain Hazelwood would go to the Pipeline Club, have a few too many to drink, leave third mate Kagan on, in charge, and run harder ground on Bly Reef. I, I, human beings are in charge, okay? If you look at what happened in Deepwater Horizon, same thing. We will make mistakes. Um, when I was working with oil and gas, that's what happened. I was with the AOGCC. People made mistakes. Small mistakes and big mistakes. Hopefully when we come around to it, they're not the big mistakes, they're the little mistakes. So that's one thing. The whole idea of a five-year plan I'm, I don't know what the feds do. When I was working um, way back with DNR, a lot of it was industry driven. They want to, they'll tell you. They'll tell you where they want to lease things because they have an idea of where the oil is going to be found. Industry, and having worked with industry, they are short term driven. They want to maximize profit and they're willing to take acceptable risks. They're not crazy. They don't want to take unacceptable <laughs> risks, right? But, but they take acceptable risks. And the regulations that we place on them reduce and control the risk. Because frankly, what we do here, and for example, what they do in South America and China, very different and in other places. The government gets to control the level of risk on some level. So I think we need to have a very big policy consideration. Okay? We want to develop resources, acceptable risk. How do you answer those questions and I think we need to look not, not just onshore and offshore, but, you know, not just offshore, let's talk onshore. What can we develop, what makes the most sense, and what is the level of risk to the environment we are willing to tolerate? That piece of the whole environmental risk is also changing. Um, for example, I think just two weeks ago or three weeks ago, um, Alaska Supreme Court came up and said what? Um, air quality is now a public trust. So pollution um, is a public trust, water, you name it. So now we have, you know, what do we balance um, from the development versus the risk? I, mean, I think that's a broad policy question. Um, starting there, then we can come down and say, what regulations do we want? Um, I'm going to put on my judge hat and say, you know what, I agree sometimes there are too many regulations, but it's better to have clear regulations than not to have clear regulations because whether we like it or not, when decisions are made, there are implicit decision points. So you can actually put it out in a clear and make everybody know and have a transparent system or something more opaque. Uh, transparent systems, I would propose, is a better system because it allows, it allows transparency and those interested parties that we have a whole list of. And the people who don't agree with it, they can test it. And generally what happens? You end up in court, <laughs> right? <clears throat> and so you can have essentially, you know, clear policies, clear guidelines, and have interest groups out there and say, this is what we think is the proper balance or not, and then have it happen. The problem with the Arctic is this, and, and Alaska and um, what we're talking about. Um, I can't say I've been out to the Chukchi Sea or the Beaufort Sea, but I've been to Dutch, I've been to Kodiak, I've been to a lot of villages. I've actually been to the North Slope in winter. I've been to Prudhoe in winter. It's the closest I've been to the moon. I kid you not. <laughs> All right? You know, you fly in a plane, and out in the middle of nowhere, there's this place that's glowing <laughs> with lights, and you land in an airplane, and you get to a place with a swimming pool. Um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting idea to develop you know, Prudhoe Bay. And I think if you go out into the sea 
and you're out there, what, 5,000 to, what, 30,000 feet now? The technology allows you to do that? We, we are talking basically going into, I would say, the equivalent of outer space because we really don't know um, what's out there. So I'm going to end what I have to say by quoting um, Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> there are the known knowns. There are the things we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. And I believe, well, Professor Fortson, it's we question have, time. Uh, five minutes left on this panel, so Professor Kavitz, I know that you had some thoughts that you wanted to give your. No, I think uh, we'll leave it open for the questions from the audience who have been storing up their questions for everyone. So. <laughs> well, in that case, um, yes, yeah, so if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them, both of this panel. Uh, we have all uh, the non-telephonic panelists still here, and so if you have questions from other panels, I would say uh, feel free to open it to them. We've got a mic, the same mic, which Hopefully it's got tape around the bottom now, so yeah. hopefully it'll stay in, in one piece. Um, so are there thoughts, comments, questions? Joe, play your hand first. The falling apart Mike added some fun this morning, though. <laughs> that's, that's true. It did make it more entertaining. I mentioned to uh, Betsy when we were talking about the coastal zone management. Uh, back in the 80s, I was on the Alaska Coastal Policy Council. It's comprised of five state commissioners, nine elected officials, and the director of OMB. I was an elected official from uh, Anchorage at that time and served for two years. During that two-year period, there was not one single project that was delayed or stopped. There were projects, though, that we tweaked. We made the developers, the parties who wanted basically our blessing. Uh, we made them uh, conform to certain things that the localities wanted, that the uh, state wanted, and it's a, sh it's a damn shame that the election in 2012 was totally misrepresented as to what restoring that council would do. It, it, it's a tremendous control for local entities, boroughs and cities, coastal cities, uh, and I agree the political environment is such, I don't think it'll ever come back, and that's a damn shame because we really lost a lot. It's worth on CBC. So, coastal program. Um, there's a part of it that doesn't get talked about a lot. We talk a lot about process, we talk a lot about coordination. But where it really started was the standards, the statewide standards that um, were the overarching start to the whole program. And a standard an example would be transportation corridors, where uh, a standard would say you'll avoid having transportation routes along the coast. When you have to, you consolidate them. That's a pretty clear one. There's a lot of them that are not that clear. That was part of the problem with the program itself. So we had the statewide standards, and then the district programs had to be consistent with those standards so they could be refined for, you know, the variety around the entire coast. So the way I think about it is everyone had a time piece, a sheet of music that everyone had to work with. The statewide standards and then the district programs, federal government, state government, <coughs> and the locals all had to perform their permitting consistent with those standards. So when we talk about trying to fix this fragmentation, trying to bring everyone together, I'm wondering if, I don't want to say that this would be easy, <laughs> it would be very difficult, but if that's the place to start, is that we start with these standards, because this is advanced planning, this is you know, a way of looking forward, it's flexible, um, as noted, you know, as technology changes, the regulations can't keep up with it, but if we have these standards in place that everyone has to be consistent with, that can keep that flexibility that we we'll need to keep up with things that we change. And it was having those standards, actually, that led to the coordinated process. 
because you had each of the agencies interpreting the standards differently, so you had to have the coordinated process. So you start up here with the standards, and then you get to the coordination, and you get everyone at the table trying to figure out, like Joe said, you, you, once you're there, then you can figure out how to make development happen in a way that works for the state, works for the local uh, communities, and I think Vera's got her hand up. <laughs> Well, uh, any, any responses to that? And then actually we have another hand up uh, and we'll, we will get to you, Mara. Because I do have a response. Okay, well, by all means. Uh, uh, okay. Well, my, my response would be, um, based on my uh, research, is that the only concern I would have with that having worked with local communities within the Coastal Zone Management Program, um, I worked with communities who were not within an organized borough. And there was a lot of discussion about do we become an organized borough so that we can take advantage of the local government protect or the local community protections that would happen. And the ultimate result was no, we don't want to <coughs> because it's not worth being overwhelmed by, by the power of the major cities within the regions that we were talking about. So I would just caution us as we're thinking about and longing, you know, looking backward longingly to the coastal zone management arrangement is that it's still relied on the political subdivisions that the state recognizes, and the state still doesn't recognize tribes. And so if we're gonna amend, like if we amended Title 11, which is the provision of state law that creates um, cities and municipalities to include and at least mention the word tribes, then I think we're getting to a better point. It's not gonna happen with 60 people down the Right. So Sorry, vote. Stuck. Are there responses from the panel um, to either comment? Well, just very briefly. I mean, if, if we, if we, I mean, it's interesting. We're talking about these different contexts, but there are a lot of the same kinds of regulatory governance kinds of questions across so many of the problems we're talking about today. And the one thing I would say is that that approach works if you don't have a bunch of top-down stuff already pressing down. So it wouldn't work as well in the offshore drilling context because there's just a ton of international and federal sort of mess that's already pushing down. And so a, a, like a fully bottom-up approach wouldn't work and it would have to be an integration of a bottom-up approach into the top down as like, for example, the regional citizens advisory councils have tried to do. I have two questions. Do you think fracking will ever happen in Alaska? My second question, what laws or regulations can be used to challenge or stop fracking? Um, I'm worried about uh, possible, like Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns caused by fracking, like tremors, earthquakes, disrupting the water table adverse effect on water quality, like shaking loose some natural toxins like arsenic. Anybody know anything about that? Well, I can take, take a first stab about uh, why Alaska is unique, a unique environment for fracking and why in many places it probably will, is unlikely to occur. Um, the, an example on the North Slope, um, you know, fracking, if you look at maps um, of North Dakota, um, fracking is very well intensive. It requires drilling almost hundreds of wells um, in various areas to go in and break apart the rock. Um, whereas on the North Slope and drilling into conventional plays, you can drill in with far fewer wells and produce a lot more oil and gas. The challenge for fracking on the North Slope is you don't have year-round road access. Um, you can only um, do your road access during the winter on the ice roads. Fracking requires year-round road access to get to the wells, and it's not clear at all that it would ever be economic on the North Slope to drill the hundreds of wells necessary to engage in fracking. Now, economics could change over time, technology could change over time, but it's very important to understand um, fracking is not just a different drilling technique, it really is night and day from drilling into conventional oil and gas plays. Now, um, some of you may be familiar with um, Great Bayer Petroleum, uh, which bought some leases in the Source Rocks for Prudhoe Bay, and they are thinking about trying um, to implement a fracking program on the North Slope. They think there might be um, enough oil in the rocks and they might be able to do it, but the challenge that they face is the amount of wells they have to drill and dealing with something like year-round road access. Um, pulling down to Cook Inlet, 
um, economics are ch economics there are challenging again as it is um, to drill into um, conventional oil and gas plays of which there are still many left in Cook Inlet. Um, so at the moment, um, it's not necessarily on the horizon. Now that could change um, certainly over time, but certainly almost all of the export, I think exclusively right now, the continued oil and gas exploration in Cook Inlet, again, is looking at conventional oil and gas plays. So I would add to that, this is, a, this is a tangent a little bit from the question you're asking, but if you step back up a level to think about not just necessarily fracking, but techniques that may be developed or have been developed over over time, and as if you merge that idea with what Judge Tan was talking about, you start to think about what, what are the risks, benefits versus trying to figure out what would happen if we went back to places that where we've already explored or developed and um, and given up um, because the technology didn't exist at the time to get resources that might still be left. So it may be possible to go back to places um, on shore that have already been. Um, have already been subject to industrial activity and figure out how to get more oil out of them. I don't know if it's fracking or or other techniques, but it is something that that ought to be considered in a longer term vision for when and where we're going to allow these kinds of activities. And the second thing is that there is, in fact, offshore fracking. So some of the wells in the Gulf of Mexico have um, have been subject to fracking at the end of their useful lives. We don't have any of that um, in Alaska. And I don't know that it's it's likely or coming. Um, and the 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 only additional thing I'd say to that is, you know, I mean, there wasn't mention yet of the fact that Alaska has been, I think, doing some actually some good thinking about fracking regulation. Um, and I think that there's a there's an understanding, um, you know, I mean, it's it's a little unclear how that all will ultimately shake out. I think, but it, there's at least I think a, a a good understanding that there's a need to control the risks if if it happens. Um, one of the things that's that's really going to constrain it right now is natural gas is too cheap. It's it's expensive to. I mean, again, like when you think about what it would mean to to do it on the North Slope, and I mean, there's also permafrost in some of the places they're thinking of fracking. Like it, it's really physically hard. That means it's really expensive. And so, if natural gas is super cheap, it doesn't make any economic sense. So for so put the environment to one side. If the economic logic isn't there, it's not going to happen. Um, but you know that may change over time, right? And so. You know, the, the second thing I want to say, and, and I know this may put me in this weird place, right, where, where nobody likes what I have to say, but, um, but I don't necessarily think hydraulic fracturing is, is that inherently terribly dangerous a technique, necessarily. Um, it's all about how it's done. And one of the major problems in the lower 48, if you look at what's going on with fracking, um, is that unlike deep water drilling, Right? There's not federal regulation that meaningfully deals with those risks, even though the places where they're fracking cut across states. And so you have different states with different standards in the same natural gas field, which is creating a mess, and a lot of those standards aren't high enough to, to create the groundwater protection that's needed. If you had good groundwater protection, if you had good regulation of what chemicals are going in, if you had good monitoring of groundwater, of the various techniques one might talk about, it's not actually one of the environmentally worst. I mean, and it's a kind of in-between one for climate change. There's a new report that just came out that said fracking actually hurts climate change, right? That, you know, but it is better than coal from that perspective. So, you know, I, I mean, there's a, I mean, I think fracking is complicated, and I think a lot of the conversation about fracking isn't complicated enough. I think that people get sort of fracking is terrible, fracking is great, and it's, I think, lives in an in-between place. Other questions or comments? I, I had a question for Mr. Levine. I, I, I thought I heard you say that, um, uh, that we should, devote more attention to uh, the choice of when, where, and how we select lands for leasing at the very beginning of uh, oil development and exploration. And someone else said, well, you know, normally it's the industry that comes in and says, I only have so much money to drill, and this is where I think the oil is. Uh, that makes sense to me, that that's the way it would be selected. And I'm wondering if that is, in fact, the way it's selected, and if if you would change it. Yeah, um, that's it. I appreciate that, that question, and I'll answer it in, in two ways. The, the first is that, that 
yes, in fact, there's lots of input from states and from industry into the into the process, and that's inherently a good thing. Um, in the the way the process so in uh, in 1981 or two then secretary of the interior james watt committed to leasing a billion acres offshore in the u.s as part of president reagan's energy policy and the way he went about doing that in part was to change the way the five-year leasing program was conceived it was the first one that was created but um lease sales went from um, from small areas in which industry expressed interest to huge area-wide swaths of the ocean. So Chuck Chi Sea Lease Sale 193, for example, offered thir nearly 30 million acres of the ocean, recognizing that there's no industry interest in drilling beyond 500 meters or so deep out into the ocean. So this, this what was largely a political choice way back when, has carried itself through, um, this administration has started to think about that differently and has committed to trying to implement a targeted leasing approach in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas, in which it accepts information about sensitive areas and thinks about putting, putting them off limits in that, in that sale or in that area. I would argue that that's reverse of what ought to be happening. And if you were gonna do this the right way, you'd find out from industry, in fact, where they wanted to lease, where they, they have more expertise than, than probably government does and where there's oil. Um, in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. Where, where are they interested? What do they want to purchase? And then take that, overlay it with um, available scientific information and figure out if, in fact, operations can occur in those places safely. And that would then begin, you, begin to allow you to evaluate a small enough area appropriately to make a good decision. So um, I think that may be a longer answer than what you were looking for, but that's, that's how it's done now, and that's what I would do to change it. Other thoughts, questions? Okay. Well, um, I want to thank all of our panelists, certainly the panelists uh, from the third panel. And then our, our panelists from earlier panels, those that are still here, thank you. Um, I also want to make sure that I echo uh, Dr. Rose's thanks uh, to Barbara Armstrong, who is uh, so the guiding force that makes pretty much everything be behind the scenes in the Justice Center work, and so and she uh, has worked long and hard on uh, making this symposium work. All of the paperwork that you have is is, uh, is thanks to her. Um, thank you also to the uh, the Alaska Law Review students from Duke Law School who have. Uh, come up here, the, the two L's, and also thank you in absentia to the third year students who have been working for the last uh, year to put together the, uh, the symposium and the way that uh, Duke does this is they, the third years get to stay home so they don't get to come up and see the fruits of their labor, but uh, they were certainly uh, vital to, uh, to the success of this symposium. Uh, so at the end of something like this, I uh, I'm feeling very Socratic, not in the sense, not in the, the law school sense that I feel like I'm going to start cold calling anyone, but more the Socratic phrase that the wise man is the man who knows he knows nothing. And um, these have been wonderful presentations, uh, very, uh, very enlightening. Uh, I, I myself have learned a lot about areas that uh, I did not know uh, a lot about previously. Hopefully, everyone here can be uh, inspired to, uh, to look into these areas more. That, that you can see from the symposium today the importance of the Arctic, but also see that there are a lot of people that, that care about it and that are trying to come up with good solutions to very challenging issues. And so with that, I will close the symposium. We have a whole new set of food back there that needs to be eaten. So. Please have at it and discuss amongst yourselves. One further question. How about that Blue Devil football team? All right. <laughs> I went to Duke for three years for law school, and we won two games in three years. And uh, that's amazing. I have to say, my undergraduate school is Kentucky. Can you believe Kentucky's five and one? I mean, that's truly a sign of the apocalypse. <laughs> that's all it is. Thank you.